I haven't done anything yet. Thank you very much for that uh, very, very kind uh, uh, welcome. This is going to be a little bit of a unique uh, state of the city. Number one, um, my wife, and I think I too, am quite happy to tell you that this is my eighth and final state of the city address. A little bit unique because I'm one of the few mayors in Indiana that gave eight of them. Um, if you remember the pandemic year, my state of the city was two days before the shutdown. So we got all eight of them in, so I'm kind of proud of that aspect of them there. Um, I've been reflecting, uh, of course, quite a bit over the last uh, several weeks about what we have been done, what we're doing, and what all of us in this room have been a part of. And we certainly can say, without any question, that we've changed the trajectory of the city of Lawrence uh, into what I think is a great future ahead for us. A new standard of growth and opportunity has captured our city. We've become a city with a vision, and people are taking notice. I've been asked and invited to several locations throughout the state of Indiana by local journalists to talk about what's happening here in Lawrence. It's a great story to tell. It's a story that I enjoy telling each and every day, and I, and I tell them when we're done. We're just getting started with what will happen in the next decade, certainly. As I said earlier, this is going to be a bit of a unique uh, state of the city. You're not going to have to listen to me a whole lot today. I, I'm going to pass it over here shortly, but I have two individuals Daniel Byer and Jared Lowe, uh, Jared Hooten, who are just unbelievable uh, media specialists. And I challenged Daniel almost six months ago, and I said, you know, I'm thinking about state of the city, and, and I want to be able to do it, you know, be able to reflect on all that we've done. And one of the things, the comments I made was that one of our issues is, is that we are here every day, and we fail to see and keep up with what all is, is being accomplished. And so Daniel was given the task of trying to capture seven and a half years in 25 minute video. So if you don't think that's a hard, tough task, uh, I can tell you it, it's a tough task. I've seen this once and I can tell you that uh, I'll try not to get emotional toward the end, but I'm sure I will. If anybody has been around me will, knows that, but I'm going to turn this over. I hope you, I know you'll enjoy the video. Uh, I know you'll enjoy where we came from and where we're headed, but Daniel, I'm going to turn it over to you now. I was brought in on the Lawrence team in April of 2012. I've been in the city of Lawrence for 22 years now. And I've been here this year now, 36 years. I'm in my 35th year. The only mayor I haven't worked for in the city of Lawrence is uh, Mayor Settles. That's, I've, everyone else I've worked under. I've had the opportunity to work for every mayor of the city of Lawrence except the first mayor, which is Mayor Settles. The administration prior to the Collier administration was very I'll be honest, it was it it was rough. I think Mayor Jessup of, of himself was was a uh, honorable man, but uh, was, I think it was largely the people that he had surrounded himself with. Uh, there was a lot of oversight on what we could do with the funding of not having enough money to get the cars fixed and not having money to do this or do that. So yeah, it was it was a stressful time. I can attest to the fact that the utility the morale was pretty low. There was no real forward momentum on anything. There did not even seem to be a vision for the city. The city kind of lost its shadow. We were just like this status quo flat. We had to hold off on repairs. We were borrowing tires and other parts. We were just basically told pretty much no on anything that we needed to function as a, as a fire department. I didn't really have any political inclinations at all. I was a teacher and a coach and so on. But I also saw a real need uh, for some, what I would call dynamic or a leader with some vision that could take the city to another level. Cities like Fishers and Noblesville seem to be growing at a very rapid pace, but Lawrence wasn't doing much. I think for too many years, that was kind of the accepted norm, you know, that no change is good. And I knew that if I was going to be that person who would bring the city out of its comfortableness, I would ruffle some feathers. We turn our attention now to Lawrence, where incumbent Dean Jessup is now out of a job. It was a tough battle, but Republican City Councilman Steve Collier beat Jessup with more than 55% of the vote. Collier tells me he's very much looking forward to day one in office. He says some of his first priorities will include meeting with local business leaders, working to improve economic development, and making Lawrence a destination city for visitors. 
So I'll never forget getting the call from a newly elected mayor, Steve Collier, would I have an interest in becoming the city controller. And so I didn't know a whole lot about Lawrence. And so before I met with him, I Googled Lawrence and noticed a week after he got elected, S&P downgraded the water utility to junk status. The water utility was pretty much bankrupt and the sewer utility, while maintaining its own, was gonna need some kind of adjustment here real soon. And then of course I meet you know, Mayor Collier for the first time. I told him that we were in pretty bad shape. I, you know, I'd, I'd been here and I'd, I'd looked at it long enough and I told him, I said, this is gonna be quite a challenge. The city was on the brink of financial ruin and not a lot of people knew that or understood that. I don't think anybody really understood that. He basically said, hey, I just want you to know this place is a mess. And he was right. That turned out to be the exact right thing to do with him. Luring him into the city by challenging him, saying how bad it will be. He was so genuine in what his vision for the city was, which was literally just to fix things. And so he had me sold. He and I were of the same mind. We know what we got. What we're gonna do is set a path for the future. What I didn't know at the time was that interviewing for these positions was kind of unique. In the past, they'd always just been appointees, political appointees. That didn't seem like a very intelligent way to, to replace people. I applied to be the chief of police. I applied online. Sure enough, I got a phone call asking for an interview. We had eight people that sat down for the interview. When Dave was done, he literally blew it out of the water. My problem was, could I get him away from IMPD? He was making $20,000 more a year than, he, than I could pay him as my chief of police at the time. I took him out to breakfast. I said, if I offer this job, are you going to take it? Boom, right away. He said, yes, absolutely. And then he went through telling me all the things, all the reasons why he wanted to be here in the city of Lawrence. I just hit a home run. When he called me after all the interviews, he goes, do you know Steve Collier? Two things. I don't like being blindsided. I like to know things up front. And I need you to be an advocate for your firefighters. Easy. Those words were great to hear. We're not going to worry about where we're coming from. We're going to set a path to where we want to get to. As a city, we were primed for growth. In January, the first day we come in here, Sandy Solutions discovered that the servers were extremely old. It had crashed and we lost a lot of data. I think I'd been here all of about three weeks, and the software that we use, New World, you had to upgrade it in order for payroll to get the W-2s out. So we were literally here on a Friday night until midnight on pins and needles, praying that the server and, and the software, the upgrade would stick. Thankfully, it worked, and then over the next three to four months, we transitioned to the cloud with our ERP provider, so we eliminated the server risk that we had. It's hard for me to remember how bad it was. Jason and I would meet, I mean, every day, you know, trying to figure out what we had. Come to work in the dark, we'd go home in the dark. He had a good climb upward. The water was in bad shape. The city financial wasn't in the best of shape. Actually, and the most important thing was the city working morale was terrible. I had brought the deputy controller that worked with me in Anderson here, Jason Streeter, and he and I the first three months literally could not balance our books to the bank statements. You know, we had been uh, nearly bankrupt uh, just two years before that. We had an operating reserve of about $250,000, which is essentially like nothing. I mean, we were borrowing a lot of money from the state of Indiana just to operate and that borrowing would cost the city a few hundred thousand in interest a year. And so one of the initial goals the mayor and I talked about was we gotta establish some general fund reserve targets. There just hadn't been a whole lot of attention paid to how a city can use a variety of different financial tools to be able to take advantage of what municipalities can do. For four years, I was told that we had no money I didn't even have enough money to get my front door fixed. It would blow open sometimes to the little tiny foyer that we had over there. And I actually had to fix it with a lanyard tie. We actually have pictures of all the things that we did to try and fix things. Can't say enough about Fenwick's whole team just making the city upright again. The mayor and I negotiated police and fire contracts for the first time in years. 
we hadn't had a contract, the police department had not had a contract uh, with the FOP in four years. It was just like every couple months it was, what, Fenwick did this, we were able to you know, get this or buy that. It was just crazy how he was coming up with ways to push the police department to where it needed to be. Our training budget for the City of Lawrence Police Department was uh, very, very low. And I think we quadrupled our training budget in that very first year. I want everybody to know, camera's rolling, high definition, video, audio, what you say is going to be captured, what I say is going to be captured, and we're all going to be above board here. With Jason's financial background and his planning, along with the mayor, if it's something we really needed, they found a way to make it happen. It was very evident when I became chief of police that we had a problem with our vehicles. That was the first thing I noticed. I mean, we had some cars out there with more than 200,000 miles on them. We felt it was important to, every five years, the fleet should have effectively been turned over. I think a combination of things that the mayor set out as priorities boosted morale pretty quickly and pretty early on. When Steve come about, people perked up. He put us all together as a team, and now we're, we're solid. We were able to get a handle on what our finances were and kind of nurse our way through that first year. When we submitted for the first GFOA budget award, part of that was just a message of positivity. Like, hey, look, our financials are no longer you know, laughable. I mean, this, we're earning awards for our financials now. At the end of that first year, we had $2 million in, in OR. That was a big victory for us back in 2017 to have that kind of, of operating reserve. Once you stabilize the municipality financially, you can get better bond ratings. Your bond rating increases. That means you can borrow money or bond money at a lower interest rate. Ultimately, it saves the city money and you're able to move projects forward that, that need to get done uh, without putting the city in a financial hardship. The government center was never intended to be a home for the police department. We had to move out of 4455 McCoy Street during an emergency situation. We had two inches of brown water in the basement. So we had to get out of there. And it was never intended to be permanent. Well, there we were 10 years later. If our police department is going to be a legitimate law enforcement organization moving forward, we need a home. Our utility, both on sewer and in water, was had junk pond status. They were in terrible, terrible financial shape. We had had superintendents who were political appointees who didn't really know how to run a water and sewer utility. The city has two main water treatment plants. That's a tremendous asset for the city, but one you have to continue to maintain. I don't think anything had been done in decades. We'd gone through three previous administrations who were scared to death who had increased water rates, and we paid for it. I had meetings with three or four different people who wanted to come in and were offering to buy the utility. Luckily, uh, for, me, for me anyway, I got to know Scott Salisbury real well. He should have been our utility superintendent a decade before. You want to maintain local control of your water and sewer. When you surrender that right, then you're at the, the mercy of the private utilities, which are often driven by shareholders. Their bottom line is really all about profit. Whereas we at the city, we're not a profit earning utility. I tried to be very candid with him. He was very candid with me. He said, if the utilities are broke, we're gonna fix them. He says, I don't care if it costs me a reelection, we're gonna fix it. We have an asset that we sit right on top of. You know, we sit on top of the, the largest aquifer in central Indiana. Our water comes out of the ground. Our tanks are always full. And Scott and I were on, we, we were on the same page from the very first day, is that we were gonna try and get things corrected. Obviously, we had to address rates. There were no financials. There was really no nothing, you know, as far as policies and procedures as it pertained to the finances. And so, after we put all that in place, we put a presentation together of kind of where things have been versus where things are now and where things will be. The vast majority of the increase, what we need is to fix the financial end. 
which is in really, really bad shape. When Scott first came on, he wasn't a great public speaker. He'd never done it before. So we coached him on how to speak publicly, and he worked very hard. He was tireless in his work ethic. This habit of waiting 10, 12, 15 years between rate increases is why there is no money in the utility. I had no desire to get up and speak regularly before the utility service board, or let alone the council, and still to this day, I'm not a huge fan of public speaking. But he encouraged me, coached me. He was a mentor in the truest sense of that word. He set his expectations, I'm not going to do your job for you. You have to do your job, but if you need help, come and talk to me. That set the tone for the whole thing right there. We were having some serious conversations about if we did not get an increase that the utility may default on its bonds. Six to two, it is adopted. All right, proposal number seven, amended version, it is adopted. Keep in mind, we raised water rates over 50%. Now that's a huge increase in water rates. Thank you for stepping up to the plate and exhibiting the very kind of leadership that this city needs. Thank you for moving Lawrence forward. We will continue to be a great city <clears throat> with great people. Thank you, Mayor. Obviously, with a junk-rated utility, you're not gonna be able to do much. Scott, the mayor, and I drove up to Chicago to meet with S&P and say, hey, here are all the things we've done. We'd like you to consider giving us an upgrade. About six weeks later, we got a two-notch upgrade, so we were at least back to investment grade. Over the next two years, we got three more upgrades, so a grand total of five. Our bond rating had gone up five notches in, in the positive direction, which is kind of unheard of. Once we got it upgraded to investment grade, we did our first bond issuance. But this really is a new day for Lawrence Utility, where we can take care of what are critical needs uh, for the city of Lawrence and getting into position where even years from now we'll be able to look back on this and say this is where it all started. This really is the culmination of a vision, this new plant. It, it's the beginning of the realization of a vision to, to rehabilitate, to replace, to upgrade the city's infrastructure and make it top notch. We were reinvesting ongoing every year three to four million back into the system in terms of new water mains, new meters. The Rich Heart water treatment plant and the Fort Harrison water treatment plant are effectively brand new. Both water towers have been rehabilitated and yes, Scott, we did keep the hot air balloon that you fought so hard against. So we have two water plants that can produce literally all the clean water we could conceivably think about doing. Perhaps a legacy that Scott will leave and maybe me a little bit will be able to leave is says, look what happened to the water utility under their leadership. For the next several decades, we're in pretty good shape. Remember, I was an athletic director, so part of my background was how to create larger events, how to bring people into the stadium, so to speak. You got to make sure that people want to come, and when they come, they, they want to stay there. Our July 4th was always a big event. Um, it was ran primarily then by the Lions Club. We had an Easter egg hunt, you know, in the spring. We had July 4th parade. We had a Halloween costume contest in the park. Pretty much that was it. My goal was to try to create an event that people want to come to at least 10 times a year. We took the Lawrence Christmas and expanded it and wanted to make it into a big event. First year we had all the department heads climbed on board and built our floats. We had a little parade and it was amazing how much they did. Probably had maybe 150 people, 200 people show up for it. That was a big success for us. It started out small, but then it just grew by leaps and bounds. Four, three, two, one! We wanted to get back to those community-wide events that anybody could come to. Back in the day, all we had was the 4th of July Parade. That's all, that's all we really had. But now we have Farmer's Market, Black History Month, 
We just have a, a bunch of things that bring our community together. That's what this city is all about, bringing people of all different backgrounds together to enjoy each other and learn from each other and grow. Since I've started working with the city, I've noticed the growth and diversity with just our events. Fiesta Lawrence really celebrates our Latino community and we look forward to expanding it and having Fiesta Lawrence go global this year. People now know in other cities like, oh yeah, Lawrence has a bilingual farmer's market. They have all of these events that cater to everyone and are so inclusive. It's grown a lot. We have something going on virtually every month where people can come to Lawrence and spend some time. All these things just keep growing. I mean, we had over 2,400 people at last year's tree lighting. I think that's probably some of my most joyous times. It's so encouraging seeing people that really want to engage with the city and want to be a part of the city. It's been a tremendous growth, and that growth has happened because of the vision of the mayor, along with all the partnerships that we have established. I love the Civic Plaza. I was really excited to go to that opening because not that I want to toot other cities, but it looked like some of the other larger cities around us. This is truly a destination spot now. The bigger the tree, the bigger the people that came. This is what I envisioned it to be. And here it is, it's, you know, it's happened. When you're out in the public and you hear people talk about it, it's pretty heartwarming. It is, it's pretty awesome. can't make promises if you know you don't have the resources to fulfill them. So to pitch these things like new police station, it was a big ask. The idea of having a standalone police station to me just made so much sense. Jason and I talked about this shoot in January, February of 2016 about can we get a police station built. We were able to finance the police station project, coordinating with some bonds rolling off from the city. We're happy to transform this property into something really awesome for the city of Lawrence and all of our residents and the police officers, detectives, civilian support staff, all those who are going to call this site home for their employment. We were allowed to design and purpose build this facility, not just for today, not just for the day we cut the ribbon on it, but for 25 and 30 years down the road, this facility will meet the needs of the community and of the police officers that work out of here. Being included on building a new police station with a 911 center is just amazing. In November of 2019, we were able to cut the ribbon on that beautiful, new, efficient police station that is befitting a city our size. We finally moved out of our parents' basement and got a place of our own. And you know, we're excited about that. I'm still excited about that. It's an honor to come in here every day, finally having a home. Unbeknownst to us in our office, we actually do have a city flag. So when we took a look at it, this is the current city flag. <laughs> <laughs> the old city flag was was seemed pretty outdated. So um, when Ethan had the idea to work on a new flag, like he brought it to the council. Mm -hmm. Everybody loved this new flag. He also designed a city seal, which we kind of adopted as our new logo. One of the things that the mayor did was really look at what Lawrence is. We needed to brag about it more. I think it's pretty amazing when you look at the momentum of all that's happened in the fort and you see all the new development, not just the housing, but the businesses that are being attracted. We're seeing almost $400 million of economic development just in the last four years in the city of Lawrence. That's never happened before. He's put together a strong team to help market the city, to help get the word out to what is happening in Lawrence that makes people want to come visit, that makes people want to come live here. 
I've noticed the local community does really care about what's happening. It makes me really proud to show people what's happening. They really appreciate that, and then they can be a part of it. One of the things we've done is highlight local restaurants, which is really fun to do because I get to eat a lot of great food. I get to meet these restaurant owners who are such great people and help tell their story, sometimes with video, sometimes with just photos. I think in turn that makes people want to bring their business to Lawrence. The city of Lawrence is certainly being viewed in, in a very, very positive light right now and, that, and that's a tribute to my staff and to the people working for me. You look at what we have happening within the heart of Lawrence, everything from our bike shares, to our pickleball courts, to the new Civic Plaza, creating this great sense of space that really makes Lawrence the place to be. And I believe that's because of the work of the mayor and what he has done to really help Lawrence succeed. Things like the Community Crossroad Grants, the SWIFT Grants, going out and getting money to be able to invest in our capital improvements, all those are somewhat new to the city of Lawrence. Being able to have access to the kind of investment, both private and public partnerships, are all going to pave the way for a, a really bright future for the city of Lawrence. I'm happy to say that in the last probably two years, I've had more people come to me that have expressed a desire to live, to move into Lawrence than I've ever had before. We're doing a great job of selling ourselves to the community right now. I'm as proud as I can conceivably be by the people that, my, by my staff and, and their effort. People seem to be all in. I think the reason people work so hard for him is that he trusts you and he lets you do what you need to do. That's one of the things I like most about Steve Collier. He hires people to do a job who are qualified to do it, and then he lets them do it. And he listens. He always says he's smart enough to surround himself with good people, and yeah, he's done that. But largely the credit goes to him for being that person with the vision. Doing what's best for the development of the city is what Mayor Collier has been all about, not politics. He put the red and the blue stuff aside and decided to just do what's right for the city. I mean, everything he's done in his, what will be eight years in Lawrence, uh, to me it's the greatest eight years in the history of Lawrence and it's all because of Mayor Collier. I hope that I've in some way I've been able to encourage and to motivate them to do the kinds of things that, the, that we can do. I think that kind of fed on itself. So success kind of breeds success. And I believe that a lot of people were really, they, they got excited by it. Lawrence as a city has its own history. We have a history, but we also have a great future ahead of us. To be clear, will every one of my staff that's here stand up, please? You got me, Daniel. <laughs> so uh, before I hand this over, I'm going to recognize some people who um, it's always one of the most rewarding things for me as mayor of this great city uh, and with its great schools to be able to find people and point them out and to bring them some recognition. And the first one's a guy back there in the corner who is going to be surprised, but if you meet him, you'll understand why I am so incredibly proud of what he does for the city of Lawrence. Chef Brady, stand up, please. Chef comes to the city with a truly giving spirit and has always been committed to the Lawrence community and to make, li make life better for all those who have the pleasure of hanging out with him. His infectious smile does much to betray his optimism for life in general. He volunteered to provide the chicken wings for our community safety day, coming in to work on a rare day off to prepare spicy chicken wings for our competition. He is constantly and consistently involved in a number of Lawrence events, 
and most recently brought a good deal of recognition to himself and the city when he was named champion of Second Helping 2023 Super Bowl with this Ethiopian spiced smoked lamb stew. He's promised to make some for me, but he hadn't fulfilled it yet, so wait a <laughs> Brady is exactly the kind of entrepreneur that the city thrives on. He is quick to share praise and rarely wants to take credit for just how good his food is. What a great ambassador he is for the city of Lawrence. And Brady, we are incredibly proud of you and what you bring to our city. <clears throat> Elena, now it's your turn. Stand up. He's back there in the back. Appointed as director of Arts for Lawrence in September of 2022, Elena has proven to be just a dynamic leader that this organization has needed. Overseeing the final completion of the cultural campus, Elena has given her time to assist and to create a variety of events that are inclusive and educational, dramatically improving the performances offered to the patrons at Theater at the Fort. Additionally, Elena has embraced the arrival of Heartland Films in the city of Lawrence and enjoys the newfound national recognition this will bring. Elena has many talents herself, including poetry. Just two weeks ago, she courageously performed one of her own works before the packed house at the city's celebration of black history. As I've said before, Elena represents the kind of leadership needed to continue the city's path for recognition and success and our growing appreciation for the arts. Thank you, Elena, for all that you are doing. I continue to believe today, as I always have, that as your city goes, so goes your schools, and as your schools go, so, do, so goes your city. My 33 years of education, I guess, sort of backs that up. But today I have a special honor and a special gift to be able to recognize three people who have meant an incredible amount to me. Dana, would you please stand? Dana leads the district's marketing and communication plan. She's a passionate educator who understands the power of community in promoting our excellence. She is one of our state's up and coming educational leaders, and yet you never know it. Uh, Dana is a behind the scenes, and she, her, her product, her professional ability, stands at every time I'm around her. So thank you, Dana, for all that you're doing. <laughs> Dr. Grant Nesbitt. Stand up, stand up, Grant, stand up. <laughs> Grant's a model leader. I've known Grant since he was about this tall and he was wrestling for Greenfield Central High School, had a chance to coach with his dad. Grant, I believe, symbolizes integrity, loyalty, and the excellence that is Lawrence. He's a veteran leader who works tirelessly, tirelessly to build relationships. He is a true architect of championship spirit for the city of Lawrence. Thank you, Grant, for all that you've done. <laughs> Roger Smith. Stand up, Roger. Don't get away. Uh, Roger and I have, begun, have become very close friends. And there's a real reason for that. He's the most positive leader you will ever meet. It seems that no challenge is too difficult for Roger. He has led one of the most comprehensive facility plans in the state of Indiana that includes major remodels for, of every building in the district. His hard work and dedication has impacted every student in this community. Thank you, Roger, for overseeing the operation of the premier education facilities for the student learning today. Thank you, Roger. And last but not least, probably the most shy person in this room, but uh, Scooter, stand up. <coughs> Her name is actually Rochelle Carey. She's known to most people as Scooter and has lived in the city of Lawrence for nearly 20 years. She truly epitomizes what it means to be a selfless community volunteer and is invested and involved all over Lawrence, making our city a better place to be. She's a former intern for LPD and now serves as intelligence analyst supervisor for IMPD. This is what Shell does. Listen closely. In her free time, she serves as president of Lawrence Parks Foundation, president of Laundry and More, president of the Crystal Point Homeowners Association, vice president of the Lawrence Sunrise Kiwanis Club, board member for Arts for Lawrence, an ambassador for the Greater Lawrence Chamber of Commerce, a facilitator for the Community Alliance for the Far East Side, he's a member of the Lawrence Exchange Club, National Society of Leadership and Success, and Phi Theta Kappa Honor Society. Shell, you are a true jewel for the city of Lawrence. Thank you for all that you're doing.
Brad, it's all yours now. So, Mayor, don't go very far. That is your stool right there. So, we are doing something a little different than what we've done in years past. I get to ask the mayor questions now because they're questions that I'm sure you all have, but uh, we never have the opportunity to ask. So, we shortened his formal presentation down a little bit, and he offered to give me a few minutes to, uh, to just kind of go through and go over his last seven and a half years in this office. So thank you very much for doing this with me. Pleasure. So first, uh, thinking back when you took office, what was your biggest challenge transitioning from the classroom to the mayor's office? Well, I'd been fortunate enough to be in leadership roles, you know, as a, uh, when I was teaching and coaching. But what I saw, I'd never really, I, I think until I actually got the job, I didn't realize how big of a job it would be to get a staff hired and how important that was. And so I set about, and I used, uh, my transition team was, was kind of fabulous, and we went out and we identified people we might want to go after, and then began the interview process. And as I said on the video, that was kind of unusual to interview people, but I thought that's always the way, I, the way I'd done it. And so I found out real quickly, there's a, a literally a trove or a gold mine of talent right here in the city of Lawrence. And so I went out there intentionally to go out and hire. So the biggest thing was basically hiring a staff, as you've seen, uh, that could get the job done. And they certainly have paid that off. Dr. Smith and I will oftentimes exchange uh, information. And he's right there with me when he says, what makes you a success is not you. It's what your staff does for you. And that's, I've seen that happen for me. So the video had a lot of achievements in there. If you were to select just one, what is your proudest achievement during your two terms now as mayor? I thought about this a long time. Personally, uh, I was inducted into the Lawrence Central Academic Hall of Fame in 2018. And for anybody that was around back in 1972 and 73, I'm sure that must have been kind of an amazing accomplishment uh, that, that I would be inducted into the Hall of Fame. But it was, it was an honor that was bestowed upon me uh, by the MSDLT, and that, that was a big deal for me. And I think other than that, the obvious ones, the building of the, finally getting the police station built, and then soon this summer we'll be opening up uh, new uh, Fire Station 38. So both of those things are impactful to everybody in the city. Public safety, I'm a big proponent of public safety, but having those two things in place uh, certainly make our city safer. So, I mean, obviously, you now, you've got, what, nine months, ten months left, but... Ten I mean, months. Ten months, okay. <laughs> yeah, have it down to days and hours, too? <laughs> um, what do you hope your legacy is? Well, you know, I think that uh, I, I, it, I, it was said best when I think Jim Hannigan said something about the morale of the city workers and improving that. And that was um, not really as hard as what you think it might be because we got some, just, just some great employees here in the city. But I think overall it's something that Scott and I talked about very early and that was the idea of saving our water utility. Uh, it had been kicked around for quite some time, and no one wanted to take responsibility for getting our water utility in the shape it needed to be in. And so for at least 12 years, we were sitting in a situation in which we had this great resource right underneath our feet, yet we weren't taking care of it. And so when Scott and I sat down and we determined right then and there that we got to get this fixed, who cares what happens in four years from now? Let's get it fixed so that we at least leave that. So I'm happy to say today, if you look at our utility, we are a model. And Scott won't tell you this, but uh, Scott has been selected as superintendent of the year by two different organizations in Indiana. So that's what, that's what Scott's done for us. Nice job, Scott. So if you were, would have had another term, what is it that you would have hoped to have accomplished that unfortunately is not going to get done under your leadership? I had a goal really of creating a building, a municipal building downtown. Uh, and it still may get done. I do know that Lawrence Township has been pretty uh, uh, adamant about getting their uh, facility built. They need one badly. Uh, I would like to have seen the city of Lawrence be a part of that uh, concept. It still might happen, but I always thought that it'd be a great situation to have a municipal building in the city of Lawrence where people could come and get everything done they needed to get done in just in one building. So I, I didn't get that done. So the city has a hashtag, why I love Lawrence. 
Why is it you love Lawrence? What are our biggest ob opportunities and what are our biggest obstacles? Well, I love Lawrence because it, uh, we still have that small town feel. I mean, the, a part of the deal that you see when you, when you have these events downtown is the number of people that come to the city of Lawrence and enjoy it. I think we've kind of encouraged that and we've seen that happen. Uh, I think that um, the, the challenge that we have uh, as a city of Lawrence, and you, I mean, something we talked about, this UNIGOV concept that we've kind of outgrown, that as the city needs to develop its own separate identity, and we're beginning to see that uh, happening now, I have the pleasure of being able to visit and talk with mayors all over central Indiana. And quite frankly, mayors tend to beg, borrow, and steal. You know, we talk about what's working, what's not working, and what can you do to get this done, what can you do that done, and, and I've done a lot of that. And I've had some great mentorship. I'm one of the oldest mayors around, which isn't a great thing to talk about, but, <laughs> um, but some of these mayors that are, that are really truly dynamic and have had an opportunity to get some things done in their city, and we've kind of uh, mirrored that and then gone beyond that. I had a great compliment from actually Scott Fadness up in Fishers, who I think is a fantastic mayor. And Scott actually indicated to me that he was looking at some, what are we doing? He's trying to do some of the things that we're doing in, in Fishers. So to be, uh, you know, to be complimented in that way that what we're doing is something that Scott wants to do up in Fishers, that, that, that's an awesome compliment. So you mentioned UNIGOV, so this is a question that I'd, I'd like to get out there. Um, we're unique. We are a city in a city. Um, and so, I mean, obviously, if you live in the city of Lawrence, when you go to vote, you're voting for city of Indianapolis and city of Lawrence. Is Lawrence served well by UNIGOV, in your opinion? I don't think as well as we could be. Uh, we've kind of outgrown UNIGOV. You've got to remember, it's 1968. UNIGOV was great. Lawrence was a town of about 12,000 people. We're 50,000 people now. And I think even Richard Luker would tell you that when UNIGOV was first adopted, he thought the city of Lawrence might last maybe four or five years before we'd eventually be melded in with the uh, city of Indianapolis. As we started growing, that no longer really was a reality. And so as we've grown as a city, there are things that the city of Lawrence uh, is doing now that we, we really weren't able to do under UNIGOV concept. Now, quite frankly, Mayor Hogg said it's been very good to work with. So I don't have any, any pushback on his administration. I think he even recognizes the fact that Lawrence has grown so much that we're, we're become our own entity right now. One of the cool things that happened to us was after quite a bit of work uh, when the ARPA was, was, uh, funds were distributed, if we'd have been an excluded city, we would, have, we would have only gotten about 10% because of the way that the, the monies were going to be distributed. By writing a letter and getting the support of, of, of Braun and, and Young and Sparks and Carson and going to Janet Yellen, the Treasury, she recognized that the city of Lawrence was in fact a separate city. Because of that, we went from having about $1.2 to about $12 million in our fund distribution. That's game changing. So this is kind of a dovetail on that question. Obviously, Lawrence grew up basically around the fort when it was an active fort, largely because of the fort. But because of that, we still have a presence with the federal government here. We've got a 1,700 acres worth of state park. Um, the city of Indianapolis still has some responsibilities here. What are the difficulties in running a city where you're having to coordinate with all of those other government agencies, basically? To be honest with you, because of our history as a Ford, we worked really closely with all the different branches of the service. And DFAS, Building One, uh, they have me out there about twice a year. So they are doing a great job of communicating and coordinating with the city of Lawrence. <clears throat> One thing that we do, and I, 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 Chief Bixby coordinates this, is we do exercises over there on DFAS on active shooters. And they have a building big enough to where that gives us some, some great training. So in that sense, working with the state park right just behind me here, and then working with the federal organizations here, it's been a fairly seamless transition. Now there are some things that take coordination and it's all about communication and making sure they know what we're doing and what we know what they're doing. They're about to have a celebration in a community park coming up here in, early in summer. We have to help them do that, but it's something that we love to do. The DNR, uh, as a matter of fact, we're drilling, what, four rolls, four new wells, Scott, on, on DNR property that will, that will almost double our water supply. And the DNR uh, has been, once we got a hold of them, once they, we got them here, 
they've been easy to work with. So I don't have really any complaints other than the fact that it's just a matter of maintaining that level of communication is so important. Are the rumors true? Is there missiles on top of DFAS? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'd be guessing, <laughs> but if I were guessing and I've been told uh, that DFAS is a priority target for any terrorist attack, everybody who gets paid by the United States, that check comes from DFAS. So it's a priority target. Now, are there surface-to-air missiles out there? I don't know, but try to fly a drone over DFAS, <laughs> you won't get very close. So they got something going over there. I had a neighbor that lost a drone. Yes, you did. <laughs> uh, what's been the most difficult part of being mayor of Lawrence? <clears throat> time, uh, having the time and, and, and being able to maintain the amount of energy that you have to have to be able to do a good job. Um, my lovely wife is very good about keeping me on task because there are days when I get up when the last thing I want to do is come in and listen to complaints. I had somebody call me up and thought that it was important that I tell him where he should dispose of his batteries. So you get that kind of stuff and you don't let that get to you somewhat, but you also understand that every, every call that you get, every time that you get a, a question, they'd like to have an answer, they want to have an answer. And so my staff has done just a, just a great job of being able to get to people and tell them what they need to know. The difficulty is that when you have, there's always people in the age of social media, you know, we had, we, we sent a picture out two days ago about our guys out filling potholes. It took about 15 minutes before somebody starts complaining about us filling potholes. So you like throw up your hand, you know, what can you do? Well, you don't let that bother you. And I tell them as fast as I can, I said, I'm damn proud of the fact that we were out there this early filling potholes and go ahead and compare us to anybody around us, look at our streets, then come back and talk to me. So part of me is getting a little bit sassy, you know, as I get <laughs> toward the end of my lane, but, uh, but that's the part of uh, just maintaining the appropriate uh, de demeanor. I'm glad that you hesitated and did not tell them where they could put their batteries. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, lastly, what advice would you have for the next mayor? Obviously, somebody else is going to be sitting in these chairs next year. What would you tell them? I tell them the biggest thing I tell them is that kind of be prepared for about anything when you come in and don't let your schedule be determined by someone else. Um, address everything that you can early and try to get yourself into a pattern or a schedule in which you can get to, and get to people, get to things quick as you can. Hire the right people. That's the number one thing I would say is that spend some time, uh, as you heard me in the, in the video, don't, political appointments rarely work. I had two and fired them both in the first year, okay? So hire the right people, let them do their job, and I guarantee you they'll make you look good. Very good. Obviously, there's a lot of business people in this room, so we are going to keep an eye on everybody getting back to work. So on behalf of the Greater Lawrence Chamber, Mayor Collier, thank you very much you. for everything you've done for us. You for Enjoyed that. your friendship. Thank you, Mayor Collier. Um, if we could give the, the uh, staff of the garrison a big round of applause for everything that they've done today.